But now I'd like to get us into our text for today. So if you have a Bible, this will be helpful to follow in your own Bible. It'll be on the screen as well. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. We're in this series working our way through this second letter. Work through the first letter Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica. Now the second one, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Listen as I read. This is remembering, of course, this is God's word. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by a letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshiped so that he sets sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who holds now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. And for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence and ask again that your Holy Spirit would work in each one of us. Uh, Lord, open our ears and our minds so that uh, there's no obstacles, no resistance to what you would speak to us, and especially, Lord, then what you would change in us. Um, Have your way with us is our prayer, and we pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen. So I know there's a lot in these 12 verses here and probably a lot of questions, but here's what I want to do to start us off. I want to give us a little focus because I think the primary purpose of why Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, why he wrote this is important for us to get and not forget as you get into some of these details, okay? The primary purpose, and he puts it out for us there in the first couple of verses, The primary purpose of Paul is that he wants to write to Christians who are unsettled and alarmed and help them to have a peace. They're unsettled, he wants to settle them. They're alarmed, he wants to bring them down and say, no, you need to have a confidence here when otherwise you're you're really disturbed, you're you're fretting, you're anxious, you're worried, and, and Paul wants to correct that. So don't forget that in everything else that he's going to say here, some of these kind of bizarre things that maybe if you've never read this before, you're trying to figure out what man of lawlessness and what what is all that about. His primary purpose is he's writing to young Christians, we said this is a young church, that is unsettled and alarmed. And he says, there's good reasons for you not to be. And that's what we want to dig out today uh, in the time that we have. Not to be worried and anxious. Um, and this, of course, is very, very difficult. Um, and, and nobody really wants to be worried. I mean, I, I talk with many of you. I do this. I struggle, too. I, I get worried and anxious over different things. And, and from a personal perspective, of course, we look at it like, well, yeah, I don't want to be that way because, of course, it, it, you can't sleep. You know, you get ulcers. You know, your hair starts to fall out. You're a party pooper. You're just kind of always down all the time. So you don't want to do it for personal reasons. But I want to tell you a bigger reason than just what it might personally help you is this worried anxious christians 
do not reveal the greatness of God. In fact, my anxiousness and worry hides the fact that God is great. And so one of the primary reasons is not first, what can it do for me? How can this just help me? But always it's in a relationship to God to say, how can I glorify God in my life? And Paul says, I don't want you to be unsettled. I don't want you to be alarmed in the way that you live because in many, many ways it, it hides God. It doesn't show people that we live among how great he is. And he wants to help this church with that by very, being very specific in some of the things that he mentions. And I know um, th this is hard because we're like, so if you want to unsettle, or if you want to settle people who are unsettled, what's the first thing you start to talk about? And Paul launches into this discussion of the Antichrist. It's not really the first thing that I would think of when you're trying to settle people down. I mean, we've got our granddaughter, Evelyn, and, and she reads a book before she goes to bed. It's not on my thought list to say, hey, Evelyn, Let's grab stories of the Antichrist and let's read that together before you go to bed. That's not how you settle somebody down usually. But Paul says it's really important in this case that you guys understand the Antichrist. You're like, Cliff, I didn't read Antichrist anywhere when you were reading through that text. Well, here's what I want to say. I, I, the word Antichrist, by the way, is only used four times in the whole Bible. Three times in 1 John and once in 2 John. So John writes about the Antichrist but I think Paul does too. Most scholars believe he's talking about that because there's a lot of similarities here. Let me put two verses side by side. A couple from our passage, but also one from 1 John 2. 1 John 2 says, As you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. And then when you read our passage again, when Paul talks about this man of lawlessness, that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. And then Paul also says, the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. So you see some parallels here. So most scholars say that Paul's actually referencing the same guy that John is, that it's the Antichrist, another name for him, the man of lawlessness. Now, as soon as Paul starts talking about this guy, and he's trying to say part of the reason you're unsettled is because you don't understand this. This will help you. The first question, the natural question, of course, is who is this person? Who is this man of lawlessness? How can I know who he is so that I can address the anxieties and concerns in my life? So we, we, and Christians have done this, we spend a great deal of energy trying to figure out exactly, like a puzzle, who is the Antichrist? And honestly, when you look at church history, over 2,000 years, it's amazing that people have come up with a wide range of answers for this. Well, I'll tell you who it is. The first century Christians, by the way, these very Thessalonians and others, as they further on into that century, many Christians at that time said, we know who the Antichrist is. It's the emperor, the Roman emperor Nero. You say, well, why would they think he was the Antichrist? Well, one of the reasons they said was because Nero, when you take his name and you put it into Greek, and then if you take his Greek name and transliterate it into Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, every letter in the alphabet has a numerical equivalent. And guess what happens if you take all the letters of Nero in Hebrew and add them all up together? Guess what number you come up with if you do that? 666. I heard some of you say it. 666. And so many people thought, he's got to be the Antichrist, his name. Some of you right now are wondering, does my name come out to 666 if I put it into Hebrew? That was the first thought. Well, it matches something else in Scripture. He's got to be the Antichrist. Later on in church history, further on, way further on, you get to the Protestant Reformation. The, the, the Reformers, Martin Luther and John Calvin, made a, a great point of this. In most of their writings, they do this over and over and over again. They say, I'll tell you who the Antichrist is. The Antichrist is the Pope. Now, the Catholic Church returned that favor because they actually turned around and they said, actually, the, the Antichrist is Martin Luther. And so they're kind of tossing this back and forth to one another. Further on in history, a lot of people thought Napoleon was the Antichrist. They called him out to be the Antichrist. And further on, closer to our history, Adolf Hitler. Hitler became one of the... How could you not think that he would be the Antichrist with all the horrible things that he was doing? A lot of people said, man, that's got to be... Surely that's the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness. Even closer to our time, do you remember the leader of the Soviet Union before it, it crashed and the Iron Curtain came down was Mikhail Gorbachev? 
Remember, Gore, I remember even hearing at that time, a lot of Christians were telling me, he's the Antichrist. And I'm like, why is he the Antichrist? You remember that, that goofy birthmark that he had on his, on his head up there? It's kind of this weird thing. And, and people are like, it's the mark of the beast. This guy's got the mark of the beast right there. And I have a birthmark on my head, but I'm glad it's back further. You can't see it, right? They're like, he's got to be the Antichrist. And of course, and this is absolutely true, written, People have called every U.S. president since George Washington the Antichrist at one time or another. And, of course, the, uh, the ultimate example probably would be, I've shared this several years ago, I had a particularly stubborn lilac bush that I presumed was the Antichrist at some point. You laugh, but it was an evil bush, and I was trying to remove this. Thing. All these things, could it be the Antichrist? The amazing thing about this text, important thing about this text, is that Paul brings up this guy and then gives almost zero particular details about who he is. He doesn't tell us where he's from. He doesn't tell us his ethnicity. He doesn't tell us any of the kind of details you'd say, I have to know that if I'm really going to pinpoint who this is, which leads me to believe that the primary thing here, the primary point of the Holy Spirit in inspiring Paul is not who, but how. Because in the verses that we've read, it says, look, Paul says, here's this guy who's going to rise. There's a general spirit of the Antichrist that's already in place from the first century, John says, already a lot of Antichrist. But it's going to reach a point where it will take a particular expression in an individual. The closer we get to the end, this person will be revealed. But guess what? It's not so much about who it is, but Paul says the key issue is, do you know how Satan works? That's what it said there. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He's way more interested in the how than the who. He's saying if you know how Satan works, you'll be prepared and you won't be unsettled and alarmed. Oh, I need to know who it is. No, you need to know how Satan works. It's the same reason why Jesus, when he talks about the end is going to come and I'm going to return, and everybody's like, when is that going to be? And Jesus so clearly says, nobody knows the, the hour or the day. No man knows the hour or the day. Not even the Son knows when the Son is going to come back, but only the Father. Jesus makes it crystal clear it's not about when. And then the natural question is, so why are you telling us this? If we don't know when it's going to happen, you know why? Because Jesus is saying, I want you to be aware that this is going to happen, not when, so that you are always prepared. I don't want to give you the particular time. I want you to be ready in every time. And in the same way, I think Paul here is saying, I don't want you to be focused on the who. I want you to be focused on the how, because then you'll be ready no matter who it is. He will be revealed, and when it happens, you'll be ready if you know how Satan works. And the rest of this passage, he's going to lay out for us. Here's how Satan works. Do you notice it? Do you recognize it? Then you'll be ready. When I was in high school and I played basketball, every once in a while we'd, our coach would give us these little scouting reports, team that we're going to play. He gives me this, he puts me, Cliff, hey, you're going to go ahead and you're going to guard this, the top scorer on the, on the other team. We're going to play him in a couple days. Here's what you need to know. He said, this guy when he drives to the basket, always drives to his left. Always drives to his left. He must have said it a hundred times in the couple of days of practices that we're getting ready. So when you're guarding him, no, he always drives to his left. No kidding, we get to the game. Th they get the tip. We come down. This guy blows by me. First play that we come down, he blows by me, drives to the basket, to his left, right by me. I think it had the record for the quickest timeout ever called in Pennsylvania high school basketball history because my coach, I'm not joking, 16 seconds into the game, timeout, and I remember coming over, and my coach never looked up. He, he had his head down. We were all huddled around him, and we we're like, what, what, what's he going to say here? And he never looked up. All he said was, he always drives to his left. And I got it. You know, it's like, yeah. For the rest of this game, I'm prepared, I'm ready. I honestly think what Paul is saying is if you understand how Satan works, you will be ready. He always drives to his left. What does that look like for Satan and the works of evil? Here's some things. Real quick, 
the works of Satan, Paul spells out, always, you can bank on it, always oppose truth and grace. Paul says the man of lawlessness will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshiped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. The man of lawlessness, that word, that phrase, by the way, literally means the man without law, kind of antinomian. He's the man without truth, the man who wants no parts of the truth. And so Paul is saying you recognize the way that Satan works is he has to. He always does. He works on undercutting the truth. And what could be clear that in our own culture right now, we've reached a point that is absolutely clear to me that that our culture has embraced this very undercutting of the truth because nowadays it is assumed, it is accepted that there is no big truth, capital T, for everybody. You, you've heard this all the time. People say, that might be true for you. It's not true for me. And basically what they're doing is they're undercutting truth to say, truth is whatever you make it. This is exactly the way that Satan works. He says, if I can get people to a point where they will only begin to look at truth relative to themselves, that there's nothing greater than themselves, this is the way that Satan works. And he's saying, Know this, recognize it, because you're going to see it. And when you see it, you'll be prepared. It's interesting, uh, I should be on Facebook more. My wife tells me that. My staff tells me that. Everybody tells me that. You should be on Facebook more. And I I try, but it it wears me out, because they should call it, not Facebook, they should call it ad book, because there's advertising. I don't know if that's, maybe it's just me, but it's just advertising everywhere on the Facebook. Our church has a Facebook page, so I, I get on there once in a while, And I'm not even kidding. I I was going to take a screenshot of this because I thought, you guys are never going to believe me if I say this, but this is the absolute truth. I go to our our Facebook page for the church, and there is an ad right on the side, and it's actually an ad for an ad. Here, I, I wrote it down. This is exactly what it said. Promote your business locally. Reach up to 68,000 people in Beloit, Kansas, with an ad for Beloit First Christian Church. And I thought, oh, my word, that's fantastic. They're going to have to bust people in to reach 68,000 people in Beloit, Kansas. How great could this be, you know? And, of course, here's the thing. We're so conditioned by this. And you're like, well, Cliff, it's just a silly ad and obviously just self-generated. I don't know how it is. There's not 68, there's 6,300 people in all of Mitchell County. We're not even close to 68,000. You're like, that's just the way. We are so immersed in this that we don't even blink anymore in terms of, well, we know that's not really true. It's just kind of that's the way our culture is. When we hear people blaring on radio and TV, it's almost just assumed, well, we know that's not really true. Do you see what, how Satan would love to continue to undercut the whole notion that you can even speak in a culture about a truth that's greater than any one of us? This is in accordance with the way that Satan works. There's another thing, though. It's not just truth. It's also grace. And you say, where do you see that? I see that when it says, and this man of lawlessness, the man without truth, will oppose and exalt himself over everything that's called God or his worship so that he sets himself up in God's temple. Now, that's an interesting phrase that a lot of people say, see, Jesus can't come back then until the temple is rebuilt. See, the Jewish temple is, it does not exist right now. It was destroyed, 70 AD. The Romans tore it down. And now when you go to Jerusalem, on the very place where the temple used to be is the Dome of the Rock. It's a holy site for Muslims. And so a lot of people say, they read this verse, and they say, well, so Jesus can't come back until somehow that's taken away, the temple's rebuilt, and then this guy, this man of lawlessness, will set himself up into that temple. Now that may be, but here's the thing that's really important, I think, about that statement. Do you understand what the temple of God is? The temple of God is this intersection between heaven and earth that happens between a holy righteous God and unholy sinful people like us and it happens only by grace you know that the temple is the single greatest edifice that God had created a a sign a symbol of grace and most people don't think of the temple that way but you must remember how the Bible describes it 
The Bible says everything about the temple was about sacrifice. Everything. What is sacrifice? God is saying, I can, I'll come near to you, but there must be sacrifice for that to happen. It's interesting. This is a, this is a picture of what uh, an artist or somebody has come up with. It. The Ark of the Covenant. Remember the Ark of the Covenant? It's what Indiana Jones chased around for all that time, remember? The, the, the whole idea of the Ark of the Covenant is that was actually in the very center, inmost sanctuary of the temple. The temple was a complex of courtyards, but at the very center of it was what was called the Holy of Holies, and in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. And inside, it had a big ornate lid there. Inside were the Ten Commandments. It was the, the, the staff of Aaron that budded. It was inside there. And the whole idea of that Ark of the Covenant was to physically represent God was present. And guess what? Nobody could just walk into the Holy of Holies and see this thing. Nobody except one person. And he could only do it once a year. That person was the high priest. And he could only go in there to see this once a year on the Day of Atonement. But when he went in, he was reminded of grace. See, here's the thing. You notice this picture? It's actually pretty, pretty good representation. But there's one thing missing. Do you guys see it? It's not the easiest picture to see, I guess. But there's a crucial element missing. And in fact, I look for pictures and you won't see this. I've never seen it in any picture. The most important thing that's missing in this picture is blood. See, because the high priest would go in to those holy of holies, and there is the representation of God's presence. But the Bible says the priest could only go in after they had killed a bull, and they took the blood of that bull for the sins of that high priest, and he had to dip his finger into the blood of that sacrificed beast, and he would take his finger seven times, and he would flick it, and there would be blood on top. It said first on top of the Ark of the Covenant, and then on front. In other words, it's splattered with blood. And I have never, ever, ever seen a picture of the Ark of the Covenant with blood on it. I, we like nice, shiny pictures. I know that. But the most important element, can you imagine something so radiant as gold-covered chest like this? And then you would see blood. Just, it would jump out at you. I mean, it would just cry out to you. The only way I can be in the presence of God is by sacrifice. And then when you realize the temple was always pointing to Jesus, you begin to see it is all about grace. In fact, the whole temple was covered with blood. This wasn't the only thing that he splattered blood on. He splattered blood on everything. All this gold covered with blood to remind us this is God's grace. That's why we don't worship without a sign of the blood. That's what communion reminds us. It's grace. See, churches can get way off on, hey, we're going to hammer the truth. You're right, Cliff. Our culture is so relative. We're going to be all about the truth. And we leave off grace, and the devil laughs. He is just as happy to have a church that's all about the truth and not about grace, and vice versa. A church can say, yeah, we don't, we're tired of all the judgmental. We're just going to be about grace, and we never speak the truth that's hard to hear. And the devil's happy either way. But when you take truth and grace, how does John 1 say Jesus came? Full of grace and truth. The mark of the way the devil works is to steal away one or both of those. Paul says, be ready. This is how he works. Sin says, your life for mine. I'll do whatever I have to get what I want. You know what grace says? My life for yours. I give my life up, Jesus says, for you. This is the mark that we have to remember. Here's the third thing, real quick. Satan seeks to tempt us with power that serves the lie. That's what he says in verses 9 and 10. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. Now, the lie is the same lie from the very beginning with Adam and Eve. What was the lie? The lie is basically this. God is not good. You can't trust him. Eve I know God has provided a lot of things, but he's holding back on you. He's not as good as you think. So the lie is you have to go reach it for yourself. You've got to grab it for yourself. If you're going to save your life, you're going to have to try to grab it for yourself is what the lie is. And here it says that he will use power, displays of power, to perpetuate that lie. In other words, here is 
Satan, you can recognize it, you can know it and not be unsettled by it, that he will try to tempt even believers with power. He did this with Jesus. Do you remember his, his wilderness temptation? In Matthew 4, Luke 4, both talk about this. He's in the wilderness and the devil comes and tempts Jesus, the Son of God, and he says, look, every temptation is about power, about displays of power. Jesus, are you hungry? He's gone 40 days without eating. Of course he's hungry. Well, use power to turn these stones into bread. That's all you got to do. Use the power. Use a display of power. Because if you have a desire, you should use power to fulfill it. That's the temptation. And he will tempt us today with the same thing. Jesus, you can even use power to try to coerce God to do what you want him to do. Isn't that what, Jesus, what uh, Satan does when he tempts Jesus to say, Jesus, throw yourself off the top of this temple mount because in the Bible it says that God will protect you. He's going to take care of you. And Jesus, of course, says, devil, you can quote the Bible, but if you're misinterpreting it, it doesn't make any difference. The bottom line is this, don't tempt God. Don't say, I'll do something, I'll, I'll pray, I'll go to church, I'll do something, and then God will give me what I want. No, that's another use of power, even to try to control God. He will do this over and over, recognize it. And it's something about signs. We, we long for signs. I, I've said this before probably, but I, I, I really enjoy doing weddings, and I, I, I still do them, but I do far less of them than I ever used to, not because I don't want to, but because I have my... I have my stipulations, you know. I know they don't need me to get married. They can go to a justice of the peace. Or I say, I, I want to marry Christians. That's what I do, a Christian ceremony. It's Christ-centered. So when a couple comes to me, and this, by the way, I'm not mentioning anybody you know. This was a while ago. A couple comes to me, and they say, uh, we want you to do our wedding. I say, great. Uh, I said, are you believers? Are you followers of Christ? Yes, we are. I said, fantastic. That's awesome. So you have accepted Lord, uh, Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Yes, we have. So for you, Lord means that you're seeking first to do what Jesus wants in your life. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Great. I said, well, then let me talk about some of these other stipulations. One of them is that you shouldn't be living together before you get married. I, I don't see from God's word that that's what Jesus wants for you. It's not God's will. And, and they're like, well, we are living together. And that's kind of a problem, Pastor Cliff, because that would be a big problem. for We'd have to get two separate places. and We're, we're, we're just, I'm not sure we're going to do that. And I said, well, Let's go back just for a second. You, you, can you tell me, explain to me, how is it that that's what God wants for you to live together before you're married? And then he tells me the story. No, no kidding. He, he's like, oh, he said, I'll tell you exactly how I know. He said, we were dating, and we, we weren't real serious yet. He said, but we're dating. And I remember one day I'm, I'm taking my phone, my cell phone, out of my pocket, and my cell phone dropped onto the ground. And when it hit the ground, it automatically dialed her number. And I knew that that was a sign that we should move in together. And I said, wow. I said, really? Now, and you know how you always think of things you want to say afterwards? And I didn't, I didn't say this at the time. But I was like, wow, I'm glad it didn't dial your dentist or your proctologist or something. I mean, what do you do then with that sign? If, if we're looking for something to affirm what I already know I'm going to do, that's using signs and wonders. And the devil says, I'm happy to oblige. Be prepared but here's the real reason why you should be un not be unsettled. Here's the real reason why Paul says, don't be alarmed. Yes, it's going to get bad. It's going to get worse and worse, and it's going to come to a pinnacle where even evil itself gets personified in individual people, the Antichrist, this man of lawlessness. But understand this, you don't have to just make it through. You can rejoice. Rejoice that God's power over evil makes you an overcomer. The man, look how throughout this he hammers this. This man of lawlessness, oh man, Cliff, I'm worried. Will I be able to stand up to that? Look how he says it over and over again. This guy is doomed. The man doomed to destruction. The man who will be overthrown by the breath of Jesus' mouth. The mere breath of Jesus is going to be enough to overthrow him. It reminds us of when Jesus would come to someone who is uh, filled with an evil spirit. And by simply saying it, the person was released and freed. And the evil spirit would had to flee, had no choice, couldn't argue. By his mere voice, he would say, be gone. And they had to leave. 
By his mere voice, Jesus can say to a raging storm, be still and instantly wave and wind are gone. By his mere breath. This is, by the way, another way to talk about the word of God. The very word of God has power to break whatever evil is coming our way. He'll be overthrown. He is doomed. It's set. It's his destiny. This isn't a guessing game. We're not trying to hope that it works out. He says he is doomed to destruction, and he will be destroyed by the mere presence of Jesus. Have you ever been in a situation where you're talking to somebody, and you're just talking normally, but suddenly they they start to bring their voice down in a, a little bit of a whisper, and they start to talk about somebody that you know, but it's the kind of talk, it's that gossipy kind of talk, it's the hurtful kind of things, that the reason they bring their voice down, you're pretty sure, is that they would never say this to the person's face, right? That's why we, and you're like, well, Cliff, sometimes I'm on the other end. Well, I, I am too, so stop doing that is what we want to say. But here's the deal. When you're listening and somebody's saying this, and they're saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't like this, and you're just listening, every once in a while, this has happened once or twice to me, the very person that they're talking about, without them knowing about it, has walked up behind them. You ever been in that situation? It's kind of glorious. I don't know why. <laughs> but because in that moment, I don't have to say anything. The person they're talking about is actually right there and hearing everything they say. And there is a, a certain splendor when they turn. Because when they realize the person I was just trying to talk, everything they ever said just comes crumbling down in a moment because the presence of the person is there. And I like this picture for this reason. Satan, make no mistake about it, there's a spiritual battle that happens. We pray over you guys every, right now in these chairs, there's a spiritual battle. And in that battle, Satan will try to square you up and look you in the face, and he will try to talk to you and whispered tones about how he's going to do this and he's going to do that, and he's coming against you with this and that. And the whole time, he's actually talking against Jesus. And the Christian knows the whole time he's talking, Jesus is right there. Don't you realize that when Jesus is fully revealed, when you turn around, it, it falls away to nothing. You have no power. I don't have to argue with the devil, but I'll tell you one thing. If I do, it's going to go kind of this way, where the devil says, you, you don't have it. I'm going to bring you down. You, you, you can't do this. You can't make it. And you turn to the devil and you say, look, you may make me suffer. There's biblical examples of that. You may make my life a misery. You may even take my physical body and kill my physical body, but you cannot touch me. You cannot come against me. The Bible says I've already overcome you, and not because of me, but by the one who stands right here by my side. Isn't this a beautiful picture that Paul's saying to a troubled church, to us, that we're anxious, that we're worried? And he says, don't be. You've got to understand something here. You are an overcomer. Let me read to close these verses. Dave read verse 4. Let me read verse 3 with it. 1 John chapter 4. Every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Know your enemy. Be prepared. Know how he works. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God. Your identity is not in how you can do it. Your identity is found in him. He has given you your identity. You're from God and have overcome them because why? The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. There could not be a greater statement of faith than to say the one who is in you, if you're in Christ, is greater than he that is in the world. And I say this knowing our world is crazy. I, I dread the next headline that comes along. And it does bring a certain kind of fear. But at the same time, in that moment, that the Christian is able to say, look, there's a big election coming up. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety over what's going to happen. But you know what, as a church? We as a church, there's a song we should be singing the day before the election. You know what that song is? He reigns. There is a song that we should be singing on the day of the election. You know what that song is? He reigns. And there is a song that we should be singing the day after the election, and I have no idea what will happen, but that song is the same, He Reigns. That is a church that has begun to hear this truth. He is greater, He is far more powerful, and by God's grace, He lives in us. Don't be unsettled, church. Don't be alarmed. Your God reigns. Let's pray.